In the wild highlands and war-torn plains of Central Asia lie tantalizing traces of the ancient world. Here 2,300 years ago, Alexander the Great became the first European to rule the East. In an epic campaign, the ancient Greeks crushed the Persian Empire. It was a turning point in human history. Along the banks of the mighty Oxus River, Alexander discovered a highly developed Eastern civilization. My name is David Adams. I'm a photojournalist, and I want to explore the footprints of this ancient world. Today, almost entirely erased. This is my quest for Alexander's lost world. On his extraordinary three-year-long Central Asian campaign, Alexander's army scaled the mountain passes of the Hindu Kush and crossed the mighty River Oxus. Pushing the frontiers of his new empire deep into Persian territory. In Bactria and Sogdia, Alexander found highly advanced cities and religious centers. Defended by a host of volatile local tribes that vastly outnumbered the invading Greeks. For two years, Alexander caught a series of running battles. Almost 120,000 people died. Now for me, how could he have possibly built any cities while he was fighting these guys? As he traveled, Alexander is said to have built a great network of Greek cities. But is this the real story? I'm going in search of the ancient culture he conquered and the lost city that bears his name, Alexandria on the Oxus. Today, coalition forces fight for control of Afghanistan. But over 2,300 years ago, it was Alexander the Great who attempted to conquer this challenging land. I've hitched a round trip on a troop transport to get a view of the lands Alexander fought over. By the time Alexander arrived here in 329 BC, he and his army had experienced more than five years of war. In a series of great battles, he'd clashed with his Persian rival. Fighting his way 4,000 kilometers across the earth, from Greece in the west to the borders of India in the east. Now emperor of half the known world, he'd achieved more than any conqueror before him. Alexander's army defeated the forces of his mortal enemy, Darius III, but victory wasn't sweet. Before he could capture the Persian king and force him to surrender the throne, Darius was murdered. The assassin was Bessus, the Bactrian governor. Now Bessus claimed Darius's title for himself. Relentlessly, Alexander pursued the usurper, right into the heart of the ancient land of Bactria modern-day Afghanistan, a place that is still a war zone today. Well, this is ISAF headquarters for all of northern Afghanistan. 
And here there are 16 nations here to provide security for reconstruction and development here. But what's incredible is that their experience is actually similar to Alexander the Great. The soldiers are here to protect Mazari Sharif airfield. It's from here that the coalition forces German contingent run fighter missions. And it's also the center of operations for ground forces in northern Afghanistan. We head out of the base into the blue box, the immediate patrol area around the airfield. Roughly 400 square kilometers. For this German armoured battalion, living on a knife edge is routine. The danger of ambush or IEDs, improvised explosive devices, is ever present. The patrols constantly vary their routes, but they monitor a set area and will use this road again. We've almost no information at all about what life was like here for Alexander and the Greeks. Much of what's reported about him is caught up in myth and legend. But what's certain is that Alexander's commanders would have been covering the same territory as our patrol. So these guys are just setting a cordon around this area, make sure that there's no threat, and uh, then they'll stay here for a few minutes and uh, to see if everything's okay. We're about three or four k's up into the mountains away from the base, uh, not quite to the extent of, of the, the blue box that they call it, their patrol area, uh, but we're definitely uh, in country that uh, could be a problem. This is a land known since ancient times for its formidable defense system, rugged terrain, and hostile inhabitants. But surprisingly, Alexander marched into the Bactrian capital unopposed. When his forces arrived, instead of taking up arms, the Bactrians laid low. Alexander was not conducting an out-and-out -out war. He was on a manhunt. His enemy Bessus had now fled across the Oxus River. Like these German soldiers, the first thing that Alexander would have done is secure the passes and the outer checkpoints. So how, how soon before you arrive are they informed that you're coming or that they, they expect you? Um, no, I don't think so. So they just... So, surprise. Good. This mountain pass is just as good a site for an ambush today as it was in the time of the ancient Greeks. Over 2,300 years Hello. after Alexander's army marched through here, the Germans are taking the same military precautions. Instead of a German and an Afghan soldier, this would have been an ancient Greek or Macedonian commander checking with a Bactrian officer. Salam alaikum. Salam. The combined international force in Afghanistan today is double the size of Alexander's. His 55,000 strong army was outnumbered by the Bactrians. Yet remarkably, 
During the first six months of occupation, Alexander seized control of Bactrian defences and cities relatively peacefully. The renegade Bessus was betrayed by his own people and delivered to Alexander. He ordered that Bessus be tortured and killed. Now Alexander needed to make the mark of his authority in his new Eastern Empire. He is said to have founded a series of great Alexandrian cities in Central Asia. But today, we know that more than half of these settlements were already established when Alexander arrived. He simply conquered and renamed them. Alexander left the infrastructure of the Persian Empire intact. For the Bactrians, life went on pretty much as it had under Persian rule. To explore what it would have been like for Alexander to rule here, I've come to the city centre of Mazari Sharif, a place where old customs die hard. And there's one ancient celebration that's still a spectacle today. Navroz is the local New Year festival. As the newly self-appointed emperor of Greater Persia, Alexander and his generals would almost certainly have presided over this, the most important event in the ancient calendar. This is a ceremony known as the Janda Borlor, the banner raising. It's rooted in ancient Bactrian, Indian and Persian New Year cults. Today, it's an Islamic ritual. The belief is that the banners at the top of the pole have the healing powers of Ali, Muhammad's cousin and son-in-law. When Alexander was here over two millennia ago, kings of all the nations of the Persian Empire brought gifts to honor their emperor. Today, instead of Alexander, it's the local governor. Only leading dignitaries gain entry to the inner sanctum. Everyone else has to find whatever vantage point they can. <laughs> to secure a peaceful takeover, Alexander continued these age-old traditions. But he had to be watchful for insurrection and anarchy. <laughs> Locals believe that if you grab a piece of material, you'll gain some of its power. It's said that the first to touch it will be cured of wounds and disease, even blindness. We stand a very good chance of being crushed. It's time to get out of here. We are at the gate. Alexander stood no chance of maintaining control through force alone. The Bactrians had a highly organized infantry, and their cavalry totaled some 30,000 horsemen, a huge force quite capable of matching Alexander's meager 6,000 mounted soldiers. And the power of the Bactrian horse can still be seen on the plains of Afghanistan to this day. Meet Halem. Monday to Friday, he's a taxi driver. But on weekends for a few months of the year, he's a combatant in a traditional horseback tournament called Bushkazi. The wood slats are to prevent his fibula and tibia 
being snapped. The padded coat is to absorb the blows of the whip. Hopefully the Russian tank helmet he's wearing is stronger than it looks. The Bushkazi matches held during Navroz are the most prestigious of the year. This is the greatest game of all. So important, it's like the Afghan Super Bowl. Before the match starts, everyone checks out the best horses. Hallam won this event last year, but the competition is pretty impressive. Have you ever seen a horse as big as this? That neck is incredible. These are such powerful animals. Have you ever wondered what Alexander's horse might have looked like? That's it. Probably black, I think, but that's about the size he would have been riding, they think. Fantastic. Today, it's the generals and the governor who preside over the game. But during his rule, Alexander would have sat here. We're told he fitted right in, adopting Persian dress and protocol. A brilliant horseman himself, Alexander may even have joined in games of strength and skill like Bushkazi. The aim is to pick up the 50 kilo headless calf, ride around the flag and back to the circle without getting beaten senseless. Originally, it would have been played with the body of an enemy. This is an echo of the ancient past, the closest thing we will ever see to a real battle from the fourth century BC. In conflict, the big Bactrian horses were used like battering rams to plow through the enemy. It would have been a ferocious slaughter. Today, deaths are rare. It's usually just bloodied faces and broken bones. Halem has been right in the thick of it. He's had a fall and he's pretty dazed. This year, it looks like a new champion will be crowned. To the victors go the spoils. In this case, TVs and electrical appliances. It wasn't only superior numbers in battle that Alexander had to worry about. It was the hostile environment. Leaving a small force to garrison Bactria in the spring of 329 BC, Alexander and the bulk of his army prepared to move on. From the city of Mazar-i Sharif, we're traveling across 75 kilometers of desert to the banks of the Oxus, the vast and tempestuous waterway that has shaped this ancient land. Today, it marks the northernmost edge of Afghanistan. Alexander had to cross the river to penetrate north into the ancient region of Sogdia, modern Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, to secure the borders of his new empire against attack by nomadic tribes. Alexander's biographers tell us that his army, crossing the desert without food or water, lost more men than in any battle. Sandstorms out here are legendary, and simply finding the crossing without good guides may have made the difference between life and death. <laughs> a 
Alexander finally reached the banks of the Oxus with his army exhausted and in disarray. After surviving the desert, he was now faced with another immense barrier. The river itself. I want to find out what it was like to cross the Oxus in the same way Alexander did. So we've picked a spot where the river's not too wide and my new friend Osman has been preparing materials for us to build a raft. It was about March, they think, and he had about three quarters of a mile to cross with all his troops and their equipment. It was an incredible undertaking and actually must have scared the, the Macedonians and the Greeks to death because this is a very fickle and strange river. So what we're going to do is build a traditional raft in the way it was described in the descriptions about Alexander. Now what they did is actually use goat skin, just like this. It's pretty manky, this is actually salted. And what they did was turn them inside out, like that, and then sew them together and then stuff them with straw. Now these are just from the local market and they've been cut and butchered. When they saw Alexander's forces preparing to cross the river, the local tribesmen left their homes and farms and began to retreat inland. But not before they wiped out all their resources to make it harder for Alexander and his army to follow them. Well, today they're actually burning this stuff off to uh, get new growth to come out. But in Alexander's time, they would have burned it because they didn't want him to get it. They actually burnt everything. They burnt their houses, they burnt their grain, they burnt the fields, hoping to starve them out. But Alexander's men would have been familiar with these tactics, and they were not about to starve. They might have been a bit hungry when they got to the river, and they were certainly thirsty, but the scorched earth didn't work. That's good. Let's, uh, let's see how heavy it is. Ah, beautiful. Uh, have a look. Okay, we'll see you in a little while. <laughs> see you later, thanks. <laughs> With improvised rafts like this, the huge army took five full days to get across. Then as now, the river is travelling at a heck of a rate. For every 500 metres I paddle across, I'm being carried roughly three kilometres, that's nearly two miles, downstream. This is uh, taking longer than I thought, and of course, this river is a lot faster than everybody gives it credit for. Come on. We're told Alexander's troops crossed with few losses but there must have been sodden soldiers and horses along the river as far as the eye could see. Uh, well, we made it. It's quite a feat. And if this river was any bigger, well, it almost would be impossible. So I'm sure that Alexander actually did this at a low point in the river, otherwise it would have been suicide. But this little raft, it's really fit for a king. <laughs> Woo! Now, the problem is, I've got to get back. 
Alexander's army spent almost three years fighting to maintain their foothold, both north and south of the Oxus, in the kingdoms of Bactria and Sogdia. As he traveled, Alexander is reputed to have built a series of great cities. But how could he have managed to build cities at the same time as fighting both the elements and local tribes? A network of great Alexandrian cities is a nice idea, but I don't think it's true. When Alexander became emperor of the East, these lands already had their own cities. I believe Alexander renamed them and little else. There's only one place we know for sure was built by Alexander, but historians believe all he constructed here was a simple fort. The rest of Alexander's cities have never been found. It's said that built on the banks of the river was the most alluring city of all, Alexandria on the Oxus. If I can find a trace of this ancient metropolis, it would mean there is some truth behind the legend of Alexander's cities in Central Asia. The first place I want to check out is an ancient site in Uzbekistan on the northern bank of the Oxus. It's likely to have been a place Alexander seized from the local Sogdian tribes. Well, we're not actually sure where Alexander crossed the Oxus because there's three or four crossing points all along here. But once he would have massed his troops together and crossed the river flats, he would have come up against the first Sogdian defences. Now this is Kampatepe. Now what we're not sure of is whether it was just a fortress or whether it was a great city. And to find out, we're going to go and meet one of Uzbekistan's most eminent archaeologists. Professor Eduard Retveladze has spent the last 30 years of his life patiently scraping away thousands of years of dust from the ancient riverbank. According to the professor's theory, Alexander constructed an elaborate Greek settlement here as a mark of his authority. It's hard to tell because more than half the site has been wiped out by the river. Though there's no question that at one time this was a spectacular city. This gate, one side, another side. This arch. And then this was the citadel and the palace. Yes, yeah. maybe. Maybe palace. Maybe, maybe, maybe palace. Okay. Place in this place. This three part: Acropolis, Lao City, and Upper City. Okay. okay. This part destroyed. This is destroyed by Amudarya. Yes. By yes. Oxus. Oxus. Um, uh, this Oxus destroyed. This place destroyed. Takes everything. Yes. So you think this is Alexandria on the Oxus? Alexandria Oxiana. Yes. Oh. Alexander Oxus. Well, what the professors found here over the last 30 years is that this was here when Alexander came through. It was a fort and he destroyed it. And what the professor thinks is that he came back and actually built a city and it was Alexandria on the Oxus. But for us, there's a lot more to dig up before we can actually confirm that. Is Kampatepe old enough to be Alexander's great city? I'm not convinced. Alexander was marching north. His army probably spent only a few days here on the river, at most. It's likely he simply left some Greek soldiers here to garrison the Sogdian fort, and the city developed long after Alexander had come and gone. I want to explore what remains of ancient Sogdian culture today. I've got a new guide called Gazelle, and a new set of wheels.
There's no better way to explore Central Asia than on a cantankerous piece of Soviet engineering like a 1973 Ural 650. But it's taking Guzal a little time to adjust to life on the open road. These locals trace their ancestry back to the Sogdian warriors that challenged Alexander over 2,000 years ago. They'd refused to accept a permanent military presence in their lands, and a full-scale revolt against the Greek invaders broke out. To get an idea of what Alexander came up against, I've come to see an ancient martial art called Kurash. This style of combat is said to be more than three and a half thousand years old. Once skirmishing became close range, spears and swords would have been no use. Warriors had to grapple with each other in hand-to-hand -hand combat to try and throw their opponent to the ground and create enough space to use their weapons and strike the killing blow. These young guys have incredible skills, but can you imagine what an army of their fathers would have been like? Well, that's what Alexander came up against, and for two years, he fought a series of running battles. Almost 120,000 people died. Now, for me, how could he have possibly built any cities while he was fighting these guys? We know Alexander must have been daunted by the opposition because in a letter to his mother, he wrote, I am in the land of lion-like and brave people. Where every foot of ground is like a well of steel confronting my soldiers. You have brought only one into this world, but everyone in this land can be called an Alexander. <laughs> Facing battle after battle, the image of Alexander as a great city builder seems more and more unlikely. At times, it must even have seemed that he'd met his match. But Alexander found another way to win the battle. And a clue lies in customs still practiced today. Some friends of Guzal's have invited us to a party to celebrate Hatna Kilish, the coming of age ceremony of their youngest boy. Instead of the young man, it's the dancing girl that seems to be attracting all the attention. She's part of the entertainment. But it seems only the men are being entertained. Their wives don't seem to be having quite so much fun. Beautiful dancing girls are nothing new here. It was in Sogdia that Alexander met Roxanne a local beauty he took as his wife. His troops had suffered defeat and heavy losses, and it seemed the Sogdians would fight him till the end. Now, Alexander tried a different tactic. By marrying Sogdian nobility, he hoped to win their loyalty and a lasting peace. I've crossed the border into Tajikistan. Here, the story of Alexander and Roxanne's romance remains deeply woven into the cultural fabric to this day. 
And it's easy to imagine that ancient Sogdia was once as rich and colourful as this marketplace. And if you're wondering what the Sogdians were really like, well, all you have to do is just have a look around. They're everywhere. Despite the civilizations and the different invasions, they've remained. And if you look really hard and long enough, well, you just might find Roxanne. Okay? Spasiba. Okay? <laughs> I think Roxanne's story might be the key to finding Alexandria on the Oxus. I've arranged to stay with a local family at a small farm. Then as now, farming was the main occupation. They still pick cotton, just as Roxanne's clanswoman would have done. Before their journey east, the Greeks had never seen cotton. Alexander described it as vegetable wool. His troops stuffed it in their saddlebags and carried it home to Greece, introducing cotton to Europe for the first time. Beside the cotton plants, the Oxus River Valley would have been lined with vineyards and irrigated fields planted with vegetables and grains. Here they still make food the traditional way and they're intensely proud of their heritage. We're told that Roxanne's father, Oxiates, was a powerful local clan leader. When Alexander conquered Oxiates' fortress, instead of killing him, he invited Oxiates to become his negotiator and his sons to join the Greek army. Then he asked to take Roxanne as his wife. I believe Alexander's marriage was part of a carefully calculated political alliance with the unruly Sogdians. Many scholars believe that Alexander and Roxanne were married across the border in Afghanistan. But ask any Tajik and they'll tell you that the story unfolded right here in Tajikistan at Hisor Castle. This marvellous citadel is actually completely man-made. It must be three or four hundred feet up here. But it's the last northerly extension of the Bactrian Empire. It's about 80 kilometres north of the Oxus, and this is about as far as they spread. And this is where Alexander came as well. He conquered this place, and even when he got here, this was an amazing citadel, a really developed civilization. They don't know how old it is. It could be three and a half, four thousand years old. But what's also exciting is that he may have met Roxanne here, which uh, makes it a pretty special place. So special, in fact, that every weekend, Tajik newlyweds come here to be enriched by the romance of Roxanne and Alexander. While much is made of their love affair, it's more likely that the marriage to Roxanne served Alexander's need for a symbolic union with the locals. With Roxanne by his side, he took on the role of kinsman instead of conqueror.
But I think Roxanne may have represented something even more valuable to Alexander than a political alliance. She was a link to their gods. And there's a hint in her name. The Greeks pronounced it Roxana, but it may originally have been Vakshana, which would mean she belonged to the Vaksu, an ancient name for the Oxus River. So by marrying Vakshana, Alexander was cleverly creating a union with local water deities. In so doing, he would have been seen to bathe in the light of immortality, an all-powerful new leader. So if this is correct, it's more than likely Alexander actually married his bride on the banks of the river. He could have chosen the site of a revered local temple to build his city, Alexandria, on the Oxus. Our search for this lost city has taken us from Mazar-i Sharif, across the Oxus River, to the ancient fort of Kampatepe. Then on through the farms of Tajikistan to Hisul Castle. Now, we're heading 160 kilometers south to the banks of the Oxus to find the ruins of the most unique ancient water temple ever discovered in these lands. The route takes us right to the Tajik-Afghan border. Not a place that's open to tourists. They don't allow many people to come here. You need a special, yeah. a special permit. Yeah. yeah. We've been given access on the condition that the army is with us every step of the way. This is Takta Sungin. When Alexander married Roxanne in 327 BC, it would have been one of the most magnificent sites on the River Oxus, an established center of pilgrimage belonging to one of the world's oldest religions. So this is what they call the Temple on the Oxus. And it's a very, very difficult place to get to. As you can see, we're right on the river. And on the Tajik side, this is a very, very secure border and it's guarded all the time. Now this was only excavated about six or seven years ago, first by the Japanese. Before then, it was untouched. But it's an incredibly important site because it goes back before Alexander the Great, or at least that's what they think now. So it's at least 500 BC. And what it gives us is an idea that these societies and this civilization was actually incredibly rich before the Greeks came. So this must have been a hallway going right through. And this drainage system is amazing because that's very advanced. This was a very special temple complex, belonging to an ancient religion called Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrians worshipped a universal creator. And for them, fire and water were agents of ritual purity. In ancient times, it's likely ceremonies took place in the sacred waters of the Oxus. As Alexander's army conquered this land, most towns were abandoned or destroyed. But Takta Sangin was left largely intact. Why would Alexander have spared it? 
perhaps because it was dedicated to the same sacred river as his bride-to-be, Vakshana. It may even have been the auspicious setting for his imperial wedding. So could this be Alexandria on the Oxus? It was a thriving riverside settlement, and some of the artefacts discovered here are Greek in origin. Tuktasungin appears to have been used by locals and Greeks long after Alexander's conquest. In my search for Alexandria on the Oxus, this extraordinary place is, I believe, a definite contender. But if this is Alexander's lost city, then yet another piece of his legend will crumble away. It is certain that he didn't found or build Taktasungin. This marvelous temple city was already here, long before Alexander arrived. Alexander led his army on a phenomenal mission to the River Oxus, the ancient heart of a lost world. His conquests are seen as the greatest triumph in the history of the Greek Empire. But that could be as far as the truth behind his legend really goes. In Central Asia to date, not one of his fabled Alexandrian cities has ever been unearthed. Far from bringing civilization to the barbarous peoples of the East, Alexander found a series of highly advanced centers. As the audacious new emperor of the East, Alexander faced resistance at every turn. He forged alliances here. But so far, I've found no convincing evidence of the magnificent riverside city he is reputed to have built on the Oxus. 